Why? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Asif Munaf, Jazakallah khair for joining us. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me, Majid. Thank you. Pleasure. Alhamdulillah. You know what? It's 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 an honor to have you here because um, seldom do we come across uh, characters within our own immediate circles, but then we see the, the broadening of the, that circle and that circle starts to stretch where there are like-minded people who are doing like-minded things and similar things to you and hold similar values to you. And then you just want to reach out and have a conversation with them. You happen to be one of those characters that I saw um, just lately. I've got to make that admission there. Yeah. No, just like, like I, I, I think in, I, I certainly believe in synergy and attraction and universal gravitational pulls and pushes and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, you'll end up meeting the people that you're supposed to meet. And, you know, we know people in common, by the way, quite a few people in common. And uh, it's, only yeah, as it transpires. Before, it's only a matter of time before we, we, we met, albeit virtually. Albeit virtually. And you know what? Um, we might make that happen in person one day. And given the names that we've just been mentioning between each other, people who we know, uh, it might it might transpire that we have a four-way or three-way conversation with these people which might make it a little bit more interesting or different with a different dynamic to the conversation i think that would be something um, uh, interesting to do and one of the things i thought which was quite striking to me was the fact that given the current climate with what's going on uh, in palestine as an example your name came into a conversation where you had spoken out and then um you were pretty much done for it, right? You know, so the fact that you spoke out, you spoke your mind, um, you were made to be backed off in a corner and bullied over it. Tell us a little bit more about that because you're on The Apprentice, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so I was on the BBC's Apprentice, which was pre-filmed. It was filmed last year, but shown weekly starting from February. And... Uh, the Gaza conflict happened in October, so six months after we started filming last year. And I was very vocal in my um, condemnation and absolute, um, um, what's the word, uh, repudiation of the genocidal intent shown by Israel during the conflict. Mm -hmm. 30,000 people dead, civilians mainly. In fact, the majority are civilians. Uh, a lot of them are children, over half are children. And I was very, very vocal in my opposition to Zionism, the Israeli Defense Forces, the the, gov the Netanyahu government. And above that, Majid, I was very, very vocal of the Zionist lobby in the UK. Because I'm not attached to Israel in any way, you know? Mm. For me, it's a, mm. I've never been there. It's a country I, I like to visit. In fact, I, I, I did have my tickets booked for October the 19th, I believe, to go to Al-Quds in Jerusalem. But wow. I cancel, subhanAllah, literally two weeks after. Uh, so I cancelled that. But um, I have affiliation to this country. You know, like we mentioned off air, we, we were both born and raised in the UK. I'm a Yorkshireman, like my Yorkshire tea, uh, like my fish and chips. That doesn't so, look like Yorkshire tea, though. Uh, it is. Well, it's a couple of tea bags, uh, basically. Uh, I, you know, I, I play cricket, etc. So I, I'm a proud Yorkshireman. Uh, so uh, when it came to Britain and the lobby, the designers lobby in the UK, Britain sending military aid to Israel, Britain censoring speech rather and Labour Party, which I was a uh, you know big supporter of uh, three or four years ago, uh, unequivocally supporting Israel's onslaught in Gaza, I had to speak up and I spoke up about it and I, I was very vocal in my support and that got to the ears of the BBC and they put me on some diversity training in, in end of last year, November, December time, um, just to say, look, you know, your views can be construed as quite strong. Your opinion is, can be quite inflammatory. Uh, so I, I issued a very, very um, rudimentary apology saying, look, I'm not here to offend. I'm just here to speak and criticize. I'm not here to offend anyone. Uh, and then the onslaught continued in January, February. But at the, at the same time, The Apprentice aired. So I was even more in the media spotlight. So like, before I was a nobody. Now, you know, there's a guy on The Apprentice. He's one of the 18 candidates. Let's Google him. Or oh, let's check what he says on Twitter. On Twitter, he's talking about Zionists, so uh, that kind of really blew out of proportion. And mm. I continued, for me, apprentice or no apprentice, I'm still the same Asif Munaf, who's, who's a doctor, who's a Muslim, who believes in Islam, who believes in human rights, who believes in um, opposing genocidal intent. And, uh, you know, being a father as well, I'm, I'm very much against killing of children, right? And being a healthcare professional, I'm against 
complete bombardment, carpet bombing of hospitals and killing of, of, of medical personnel and children ha children having to go amputations without any anesthesia you know, all these things which I find an abomination as a doctor rightly and naturally I had to speak out so I did and um, that ruffled a few feathers at the corporation I don't think it was the corporation itself it was it was the campaign against anti-semitism the, the Zionist lobby group which uh, have had a big part to play in my cancellation and they uh, literally a week ago today Wednesday I had a meeting with the executive producer of The Apprentice. He said, look, we're going to pull out your episode. Your episode was filmed and aired and edited, but we're going to pull it out. We're going to edit you out the episode. And I'm like, you know what? Alhamdulillah, Kulli Hal, whatever happens, I'm not going to stop speaking. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was kind of glad that happened because it showed me how, A, strong the lobby is. And secondly, yeah. I must be louder in the face of bullying tactics. It's only going to, like mm -hmm. I said, in The Apprentice, you might have seen when I left, it's only going to ignite a bigger flame in my belly. Yeah, and, and as this is testament to it. The fact that you have become a household name within the last few days, uh, in recent weeks even, um, it probably wouldn't have been so out in the open. Dr. Asif Munaf may not have been such a recognised name had it not been for the stance you've taken and for the, uh, the grit you showed um, and commitment you showed to your belief and your, and your faith. What exactly was it that led to um, that conversation being taken place whilst you were on the show? Was it just a general conversation between other candidates around what, what was happening and then your, your views became open or was it was it something else? Yeah, so um, The Apprentice is filmed a year, a year in advance. Our, our right. identities are kept private <clears throat> until the 23rd of January where uh, the list of 19 candidates is released to the public. So 18 candidates. And from mm. all the 18, I've been the most vocal about genocide. So the top boys do their due, due, due diligence. They go through our family pictures on Instagram and our tweets and whatnot. So they went through my Twitter. Nothing to hide. I'm not going to delete anything. They went through all my Twitter. And it's literally everything is about, you know, anti-genocide, anti-IDF, anti-Israel. Which uh, us. I hold the views, alhamdulillah. I'm very glad Allah's given me a conscience and uh, I'm very glad I hold the views and uh, I'm not going to change. They said, look, this guy offered a very basic, what seemed to be a, a tokenistic apology and he's backtracked, it seems. But my, my mm. backtracking initially was on the uh, offence I may have caused by some of the emotional language I use. I call, I call Zionist augurs, etc. That was very emotional, not, not elegant at all. But regarding my anti-genocide narrative and rhetoric i'm not i'm not i'm not going to backtrack on that that's something which i uh vehemently believe in something i ardently believe in something which i hold dear to myself you know mm -hmm. people of gaza are, are dear to us they, they are our brothers in islam particularly our brothers in al-quds in in jerusalem you know who, who are the custodians of the masjid there the third holy site in islam Mm. And it's the same people, right? People of Palestine, you know, these are dear to us. So I will continue speaking about them. It's, it's something mm. which is in our fitter almost. We have a you know innate love, and it's very hard to explain, mm. but I'm sure you can appreciate, Majid. You know, we have this innate yeah. love for the people of Palestine. Yeah. Like you know, wars happen, right? There's mm. sense of numbers. Yemen, mm. more people have died in Yemen than in Palestine. More people have died in Syria than in Palestine. And more people are actually dying in Sudan than in Palestine. It's fun a lot. But there's something about Palestine which is very unique. And I can't explain it. I'm sure you've got the same feeling. There's just something yeah. about that place, which is in that fitrah. Allah's put this there. Allah's put this there. 100%. Yeah, obviously, this is this was the first uh, Qibla al Muslimin. You know, it was the yes. first Qibla of all the Muslims where in the direction which we pray. Yes. Um, and before it became the Kaaba. Um, so, of the three main masajid, this is one of them. Uh, yes. And obviously there's going to be a, a strong attachment, spiritual yes. attachment yes. Yes. to this place. And those people who are living in those lands um, are in essence protecting our rights to visit. That's what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, when you have media talking about um, the word jihad all the, all, all the time and in such a negative light, um, jihad fi sabilillah. These, these are people who are fighting, um, you know, for their freedom, yes. and these are the people who are who are fighting. For, you know, they must have urges also to leave to live in a more peaceful place. 
who wouldn't want to live in a peaceful place with their family their elderly elderly parents grandparents children you know little babies you have um a son and uh, is it just the one son that you have or do you have more children no 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 i've got two children yeah you have two children i have children you know those of us who have children we have this uh natural protectiveness over our uh, our uh, uh, you know offspring and then who wouldn't want to have safety for them who wouldn't want to have an environment where they could prosper yeah these are people who would want that but they're not leaving because of the ummah because of the the family of the muslims they feel like they have now by default become the custodians yes of that place isn't it so if they leave they can they can leave um they can't leave now politically obviously but they, they could always find ways of leaving even now with what's happening in gaza and they're looking at ways of what's the, what they're calling a voluntary migration right yes. so even if they opted for the voluntary migration that means they're leaving gaza they're leaving palestine they're leaving uh, the land of where the prophets stood all of them you know um and i don't think they would want to do that themselves so when people think about well why don't they just leave why don't the other arab countries take them in well why should they number one they don't want to leave their homeland why should they take them in this is their right and this is where they stay and i think this is another way another reason why uh, we feel that attachment because we feel like they're making sacrifices beyond their means but allah creates the means for them and the amount of sabr the amount of patience that they've displayed so many people have looked and analyzed at the amount of faith these people have shown amidst all those atrocities the bloodshed and yet they still call out him the creator and say alhamdulillah you know um and they and they're thanking the lord that some of their family members have become martyred and they've they've gone into a better place exactly and you know we mentioned off air as well about uh, death right and um, how this gives you courage because in islam we view death not as the end but as actually the a portal into the real life because what is mm. dunya i mean is lowest yeah. the word in it means adana and low for dunya just mm. even the the life were limited to the five senses right smell touch taste etc sight mm. uh, and noise you know we're, we're limited but in the mm. next life we don't mm. know the senses all of them give us they could be extra senses they could be more you know heightened senses or we know we're mm. going to be much taller anyway there's going to be much more delight and pleasures in jannah so this mm. is a lower level of living right for us mm. you know very almost attenuated living almost you know Mm. I'm speaking like, like a doctor here. We give it attenuated virus. No, it's good. Like, <laughs> but the next life is a real life, isn't it? So yeah. having that akhirah centric vision, Majid, yeah. is super important. Akhirah centric. And you know, I said it on Twitter a few months ago. I thought I was strong until I saw a, 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 a father in Gaza picking up his children's remains. I thought I was strong. No, faith is to be found there. Mm. 100 percent on that note uh asif you know like you said we were talking about death and how sometimes it's good to be reminded of death you were showing me mud on your jacket still after having buried somebody today um and it's unfortunate some people still are detached from that reality um what is it that in your opinion because i mean you've you've lived quite a, an experienced life in your very young age um you know you've gone through the academic uh, route you've you, you've been to university very well educated became a doctor uh became entrepreneurial having your own business and you know already i can see you know you, you, your 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 way of thinking is matured more than the average 30 31 year old out there because there are so so <laughs> I see a lot of them out there and their their consciousness hasn't developed to to that degree what is it that's made you explore this avenue in an accelerated fashion um because most people at this age are still semi kind of like enjoying life trialing different things and stuff but you seem to be very focused what's led to this focus All right. Good question and uh, it sounds you. like a moron <laughs> but it's death that gives mm. us life. What do yep. I mean by that? It's death that gives us life. So you only start living once you understand the pre- precarity of life and the certainty of death. Mm. And that's when you start to live and attack life. I keep saying attack life. 
on a lot of my podcasts. What do you mean by attack mm. life? Attack life with full zeal and conviction. You know, have husnur than we say in Arabic. Have a mm. good, have a good, um, you know, a, what's the conception oh, look, of Allah yeah, yeah. And attack life with full vigor and rigor because you don't know when it's going to end. SubhanAllah, last year there was a sister Aya who passed away very young. You might have seen the Twitter page her father made for her. There's what the Ali Banad passed away a few years before her. Yeah. Young, you know, um, life, and I've seen it, you know, Alhamdulillah, this is my 13th year now as a mm. registered sister. And uh, I've seen death at all ages, right? So death is guaranteed. But also, death is not guaranteed at 80. That's the thing, by mm. the way. People know death is guaranteed. You know, you could be atheist. And still believe in death because it's a, it's the only thing, by the way, everyone agrees on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's the only thing everyone agrees on. No one can deny that. People deny, by the way, gravity. They, they deny the moon. They they, mm. they deny flat the earth. Yeah. Subhanallah. They, they even deny like humans or we're reptiles or we're descended from monkeys. <laughs> they, 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 but they can't deny death. They Literally, deny they, death. people yeah. even deny like oxygen and all this kind of. Subhanallah. They, you know, people. Yeah. Uh, it's weird stuff. People deny weird, weird stuff. People deny. Wow. But they can't deny death, right? De- death mm. denial does not exist. There's no such movement as <clears throat> called death, death denial. <laughs> yeah, you know, true. Very true. It's literally the most basic yeah. factor, right? Yeah. So, we know death is certain, but mm. we also know death is uncertain, as in yeah. timing of it. Yeah. So, we know the event is certain, but mm. the timing is uncertain. Mm. So, death is the only certain uncertainty that we know. If this is getting deep now, it's getting philosophical, right? So we no, know it's good. certain. Yeah. You know, we know the the, 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 the matter is certain. Actually, mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Hakkul yaqeen in Surah Waqiyah. Hakkul yaqeen. This is Hakkul yaqeen. This is a, the convicted truth. This is, you know, um, the, the apparent truth. But mm. the, the timing and the circumstances of death, Majid, are mm. precarious. They're up for discussion, mm. right? Yeah. <laughs> so this is what gives me the fire in my belly. Because I know I'm going to die, but everyone knows that. Right? Even an ant's going to die, and you know, everything's going to die. Allah, Allah Subhanahu yeah. says, "Kul malayha fan." Everything will, 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 will come, you know, everything yeah. will perish, right? Yeah. But it's uncertainty of death that gives me the yeah. fire in the belly because I do not know. I literally do not know if I'm going to be here alive next year. Neither mm. do you. And it's a bit yeah. of arrogance, like kibber, to mm. uh, think, "Are oh, we going to get to 80 years old and a big white beard and you know, yeah. three hajjahs and?" You know, 10 yeah. grandchildren, we just do not know. Honestly. Yeah, you just don't know. You just don't know. On that note, and with that kind of a frame uh, of mind, is that, would you say that's something that kind of pushes you to do what you feel stands with your values rather than compromising your values? Yeah, yeah? Exactly. I feel the same. To be fair, I feel the same because I've come across situations uh throughout my life um, where you know you are uh, compromised uh, in your in your faith and you, and you have to think twice do I really want to be doing this do I really want to be going there do I really want to be spending time here rather than there you know you're always calculating these things um, and I think when you do have that um, mindset about death that there is uncertainty you could you could drop off in your next breath literally right and it's that uncertain then i guess there are things in your mind that you know you that, that bring you back to uh, the straight and narrow aren't there um i was speaking to uh, uh Tokir sharif talks uh, a few yeah. weeks ago and we were discussing how when you've seen i mean you you're very similar in that sense that all of us have seen multiple deaths Yes. In one, you know, you some of us have seen multiple deaths in one go. So Tox has been in in war torn countries, and yeah. he's seen you know places blow up. I've been on on sites where I've seen more than a hundred people die uh, because of uh, uh, an accident which had happened. You know, so seeing the the de- the parts and the limbs and whatnot. Um, you in your profession have witnessed people dying. You know, multiple people dying. Most people in their lifetimes, especially in the Western world, they don't see death so closely and they don't see it in those numbers. So the most common way of seeing death for them is if a family member dies or a friend dies or a friend of the family dies. And it's usually by a natural cause, unless it's an accident or something like that. Uh, but this, but it's like in very minimal in numbers, usually one at a time. But I think when you see it so often, there is a risk with people who are in this kind of a profession that they become desensitized to it. But there's also a risk it can affect your mental health. Because I want to tie this into mental health as well, because 
Only yesterday, I was talking to uh, a colleague of mine. And this is a uh, somebody who does um, some work for me, um, and they used to work in the police force. And they went through a lot of this as well. They saw people, you know, in all sorts of really atrocious kind of circumstances, uh, de finding dead bodies and stuff like that. Whilst we were having a conversation, he broke down. Mm. And he, he's left the police force and he does other things now. But it came to mind that, you know, <clears throat> the fragility of the human yes, yes, yes. body and the human mind, sometimes it's we overestimate what we're capable of yeah. so when we when we look at what human beings are capable of i'm a firm believer and throughout my experiences i've seen that there is a different level of or a different type of uh stress or endurance that men have or what women have when it comes to different circumstances do you know what i mean and I know you you talk about um, uh, masculinity and, and stuff like that. Have you ever come across men who have fe who have felt that they're they're weakened? And what advice would you give to men in strengthening their uh, uh, mental health um, yeah. and masculinity in that in that regard? Right. Okay. So men who come to me from a position of weakness i say to them there's many things i say to them but i think one of the the biggest value value uh, or most valuable lessons or take homes your listeners can get is for men to have an undeniable stack of evidence so you mentioned a friend of mine adam a friend of, of both of ours mm -hmm. how, he's, how he's a doer there's a lot of people who are ultra successful with strong mindsets they're just doers mm -hmm. what does what does doing do by being a doer you accumulate a vast swathe of evidence that you can accomplish many things and that itself is a snowball effect so mm -hmm. one of the biggest things men when you know mental health uh, the pandemic in men uh, one of the things i find is men become very withdrawn they lack energy they lack purpose they lack execution that's the thing by the way execution yeah. executive functioning is from the brain right the frontal part of the brain so i said to them just do something small decrease the friction decrease the barrier to entry do it do it again do it again build this like a snowball gets built up of snowflakes right so a snowball gets built up of snowflakes and, and the example of the snowball is a rolling small a rolling stone gathers no moss so you don't you know mm. you don't want to be stagnant men oftentimes especially in winter in the uk are stagnant stay in mm. the same place don't get out don't get fresh air don't get vitamin d certainly they do not you know go to the gym even if they're Muslims, they don't go to the masjid. These are things which are designed to get you out and get you better. But you're going to stagnate by staying in the same place. So I say, get an undeniable stack of evidence and just say, whatever the case may be, so I'm going to quit smoking tomorrow. I did that, tick box. And then the day after, I want to quit, I don't know, I want to quit the sugary drinks. Well, yeah, last week I, I quit smoking. So I've got some evidence I can do things and execute and actually complete them. And that itself will give you positive momentum for the second thing, third thing, third, uh, fourth thing. This positive <coughs> momentum, Majid, will mm. apply negative and positive things as well. So <coughs> all I say, the JFDI, just effing do it. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no other way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Get on with it. And that, yeah. there's, there's a concept in medicine called neuroplasticity. Yeah. Okay. It's the antidote, antidote to depression. Because depression is your brain gets depressed. Mm. Neuroplasticity is your brain is opposite of depressive, it's actually growing. But neuroplasticity is only happen when you're making new connections. You make new motor connections in your brain's pathways by doing things, executing. So always be doing. You know, we are people of doing. Yeah. We're not people of just saying. And a lot of people say, don't do. We have to be people of doing. And uh, start. The best way to start, start at the gym, start walking, start praying, start reading. Whatever you, you've been putting off, start. The best time to start was yesterday. Second best, time to start. Second best time to start today. 100%, Bless you, you know, excuse me, yeah. Um, I shouldn't have, I should have got my uh, yeah, my tea from Yorkshire as well, whilst I was <laughs> but I didn't. You, you know, know but you, you don't have Yorkshire rivalry, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's not too far, you know, it's just up the road, uh, Derby, just down the road from Yorkshire. So, um, and I was I was driving through it just last week, so uh, should I should have picked some up. <laughs> you, you mentioned some really, you know, great things, the things that I often talk about myself and, and I can relate to more than anything else, because number one, you talked about action. Oftentimes, I'm, I'm asked to deliver keynote speeches at events, and one of the topics is success on your own terms, yes. which is a very interesting topic. Um, because success is a very subjective thing to most people. Um, but what are our own terms? And the three things I talk about in that is values, purpose, and passion. Um, when we come to the values, obviously this is this can turn into a whole new discussion, but without diverting, I want to talk about what you just mentioned about action. Most people say they're passionate about certain things. And I always say to them, you can't be passionate about something you've never done. Yes. Motion creates emotion. Exactly. So when you are in motion, only then can you realize that there's emotions that are evoked for you to understand that you're actually truly passionate about something. You can't be passionate about something you've never done. Yeah. yeah. And then taking action alone is never enough. That action has to be effective and it has to be consistent without the, it being effective and without it being consistent. And it's a part of uh, 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 the hadith as well, where the Prophet Sallallahu says, when it comes to charity, when you give, even if it's a small small amount, as long as it's Regularly. consistent, it's better than giving once a big amount and that's it. Do you know what I mean? So consistent, effective action. It has to be consistent. Yeah. It has to be effective because if it's not effective, there's no point taking it. Exactly. And it has to be, you have to be active to be taking the action. One of the other things that people have often said is that, with age comes wisdom. And I'm always a bit of a maverick when it comes to adages. You know, I always critique adages, you know, things like comfort zones. The comfort zone being an example, because most people say, you know, get out of your comfort zone, break out of your comfort zone. And most coaches say that as well. I'm not fond of the idea of breaking out of our comfort zones all the time, because I think um, physiologically our human human bodies, you know this doc, you know, we're yeah. designed to protect ourselves. Exactly. It's a survival uh, instinct. And if it didn't happen, we wouldn't instinct. be alive right now. Yeah. hundred percent. I would rather people grew their comfort zones. So it's not a smashing out. Yeah. Circ circumstances will uh, require us to smash out of our comfort zones at times. But most of the times, if we consistently take an effective action that we talked about earlier and stretching that comfort zone, we become comfortable at the things we were uncomfortable with before. Yes. All of a sudden, our comfort zone is really massive exactly. and we're comfortable with so many more things. And we're comfortable at doing those things. Public speaking is a great example. You mentioned it there when you have to give keynote yeah. speeches. One okay. of the biggest fears of, for people. Exactly. I think after death, it's public speaking, right? Yeah, I so, believe so, yeah. Imagine if public speaking every time was your, uncomfortable, was your uncomfortable zone. You'll be mm. having palpitations. But you incorporate public speaking into your comfort zone. It, it becomes subsumed into your comfort yep. zone. It's the same with grief, right? So, for mm. instance, this is a cop, yeah? Yeah. So, th that's death, for instance, okay? Like, mm. that's a bad event, right? I don't know if you can see it, death. No, okay? Now we can see it. Okay. And then I, I fill this with water. So, the same amount of tea will be there, but it just gets diluted with water. Mm. And if this is like a three liter jug, yeah. the water will be so clear. Because yeah. but the amount of black tea is still the same, i.e., the, the, the event. But it's just your glasses filled. It's the same with grief. Grief never shrinks rel uh, absolutely, but it, it shrinks relatively. Relatively. And that's the thing with comfort zone as well. You expand yeah. it. Yeah. So the, the fear doesn't shrink mm. absolutely. The fear shrinks relatively because the comfort relatively. zone is now. 100%. 100% on the same page. And 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 and, and the same goes with, with things like, you know, we were talking about wisdom. Age, age brings wisdom. And I always cr critique this as well because I don't feel it does. Not everybody who's of an older age is necessarily wiser. I feel experiences yes, bring wisdom. Exactly. Because you could be a 25-year-old or 30-year-old like you and have had so many more experiences than a 60-year-old who's, who's, who's you know, hardly had any experiences. And, and I would say you'd be more wiser because yeah. it's like you said, isn't it? You have to take action. You have to build that, that uh, database of yes. experiences. And then, and, it's, and the same thing goes with the, with human experiences and human interactions. I, I mean, I, I do have some sales background and, and I always point it to that and I always relate that to this. The more people you talk to, the bigger you build your database of types of people. Yes. And then so when, not, not to stereotype, but when you meet new people, you can 
pinpoint or kind of relate some of their attributes or personalities somebody you met in the past and know how to how to discuss things with them and how to converse with them how to have a conversation with them you know what i mean so these are these are really fascinating i love talking about this kind of stuff i, I don't I, I don't know why we didn't do this earlier where you know we hadn't been introduced earlier but this is this is my kind of talk you know what i mean i i love this kind of discussion um so with that being said we were talking about um having that bravery to go out and stick to your guns and and be firm and committed and can you know uh, in your convictions and in your beliefs and and display those honorably and courageously and confidently why do you think it is that a lot of people still is it do you think it's there's still this colonial mindset where which which kind of pulls people back from being themselves in that and displaying their cultures Majid, i never thought you'd ever use a c word because i love it and nobody talks about this enough <laughs> honestly literally i was on a phone call i was on a phone call today and yesterday with a right. phd student and we mm. talked about dr franz fenon who wrote a book called the wretched of the earth who's a right. medical doctor by the way psychiatrist right. uh, in the 1930s i believe and he talked mm. about the impact of uh, colonialism on on right. priority complex on black and asian people right uh, yeah. in great and so i'm really glad literally run the same way that right i talked about <laughs> colonialism I actually did a podcast about colonialism a few months ago. Oh wow. It's called The Three Deadly Seas: Colonialism and Colorism and Careerism. And it's all linked by wow. the way. Colonialism that's, that's interesting. Is it is it already out? That it's podcast? out. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's with a brother uh called Ridwan, he's a Nigerian brother. When we spoke right. about how Nigeria has the highest rate of skin bleaching in the world. Wow. Uh, so skin or skin or hair, one of them two anyway. And obviously right. in our culture as well. Um, yeah. By the way, if you look at my TikTok, the, one of the first questions is, you know, do you dye your hair? Do, you, do you, have you had eye correction surgery? Do you do eye contacts? I'm like, I've done none of that. Like, I'm, I've done none of that. But because it's appeasement, it goes back to appeasement. Because the imprint of the British colonial empire, imperialism, mm. not just on people in South Asia, not just mm. on the South Asian diaspora, but mm. in Africa as well, and in South America, yeah. and, and in yeah. the, you know, in the Far East. Yeah. Well, so and great. I think this is. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, I was I was gonna say I don't think many people understand the impact of that, and yeah. and it's it's like an involuntary reflex. You know what I mean? It, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Well, the, it, it is because it's called epigenetics. Yeah. Now, Doctor Phenon right. didn't know about this. Doctor Franz mm. Phenon didn't know about epigen uh, epigenetics because you know we only discovered the helix, I think, in the nineties or you know, uh, sorry, sixties and seventies. Crick and Watson in um, mm. in Cambridge, right? Mm. Uh, after Phenon had died. Certainly after he had published, right. and then you know, 2000, year 2000, the millennium. You probably remember it was a DNA project trying to sequence the genome, the whole strand of the, the DNA. I vaguely you know, remember something about year, that. Year 2000 and cloning Dolly the sheep and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, only, yeah. we only got a grasp of DNA and genetics in the turn of the turn of the millennium. Epigenetics mm. is even 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 more recent, right? So epigenetics is how certain genes can get turned on and turned off through trauma, and with the biggest mm. trauma. With migration and right. obviously us third generation migrants but also a, a bigger trauma than migration because you're migrating to a better country okay mm. usually economically mm. prosperous yeah bigger trauma the migration is what the people of gaza are going through and what we went through in a way and the people of south america went through and the people of australia went through it is the trauma of a occupying force of a colonial mm. occupying force and we had that for mm. 200 years, I believe. I'm not sure the exact amount, but certainly we had that anyway, didn't we? With the British Raj uh, yeah. in India. Yeah. Uh, you know, the whole India subcontinent, yeah. right? Of course, that's going to imprint. That of course, we're going to get imbued in our psyche that white is right and white is might. Mm. And uh, and we see it now in, the, in you know, in our yes, uh, you know, two backs false mentality that we have yeah. in the yeah. corporate workspace and how. <laughs> You know, it's it's such a cross way of saying it, but if an Asian guy marries a white woman, it's like he's made it in life. Why? Because he's got one of them. <laughs> and it's a colonial mindset, right? It's yeah. a colonial inferiority complex. Because mm. they were the master, we were the slave. They mm. were the slave owners, we were the bootlickers. And yeah. it, 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 it'll take a lot of generations to go. Yeah. And it'll take conscious effort, by the way. It'll take conscious effort. There's, uh, there's something called second consciousness or double consciousness, which goes back to intersectionality and all that kind of stuff. But it's a huge impact on the way we think in the UK. And 
this is why we uh, uh, you know muslims are there muslims are the lowest performing demographic in the whole of the uk we have the worst life expectancy worst educational attainment so many markers of of, of uh let's say incompetence in, <laughs> yeah we're, we're number one in all the all of these as well so subhanallah <laughs> Uh, if, if we you want something, then <laughs> if you want something, exactly. But no, it's like, honestly, I could talk about this for hours because I'm a big fan. I've read all the books about British Empire, its effect on our psyche, yeah. uh, psychologically. But yeah, definitely for your for your listeners and 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 and, uh, and your your uh, viewers, Majid, uh, the Wretched of the Earth by Dr. Franz Fanon. Great book. What's it called again? The Wretched of the Earth. The Wretched of the Earth. I'm going to make a note of it. It's got a beautiful picture as well of, of a nice girl. I think she's Aborigine or maybe South American. I'm not sure. Indigenous okay. girl. Anyway. Beautiful picture of this girl. And it's literally about that. It's about colonialism. Wow. Wow. I mean, I've, I've noticed, you, you, look, we notice it within our communities, with people. You know, yes, there are certain terms used sometimes, Uncle Tom's, Coconut, whatever, uh, where people are trying to emulate, um, you know, uh, the Western way of life. Yeah. And, and I have a, I have a bone to pick with when you know when you, especially when they have discussions about um, integration and we're always accused of not being in you know integrated enough. I think the issue isn't that we we're not integrated. I think the issue is we're not emulating, um, mm. and we've to a degree whilst we might have been influenced by this colonial mindset, some of our values are more important than you know uh, uh, commercial or monetary gain. Um, or, or, or certain ways of life, you know, and I think for, for that we only have Islam to thank because Allah has given us a faith, a, a, a way of life which it can't be faulted in any way. You look, look, you look through history how so many different types of kingdoms have come and gone, mm -hmm. rules people have people have ruled the world in so many different ways. They've all they're supposed to have evolved, right? Yeah. Yet, you can argue they've gone backwards. Mm. The only one consistency that we've had is the Islamic way of life. And it's, it provides you with all the solutions. I'm a firm believer of that. And those of us who are committed in our faith, and we try, it, we're all human beings, we all make mistakes, we all fall short in some way, shape or form. But as long as we're trying, we'll notice that we, we, do, we do get the fruits of that labor. It's that collective mindset and consciousness which is which is more important, uh, yeah. no matter where you are. On that note, uh, Asif, how important do you think it is for a community to be the guardians and gatekeepers and motivators and inspirers of the next generation? How, how important is the community in that? Yeah. Uh, good question. And again, I'll give you a business analogy so they say if you want to go fast go alone go alone, if you want yeah. to go far go together and this yeah. analogy or this maxim rather can can be applied to you know any endeavor business family and certainly yeah, ummah uh, you know we are ummah you know the word ummah means nation or collective consciousness you could say as well and islam is never a religion of of, of, of um uh, of individuality, it's, it's not an insular religion. Even your salah, yeah, it's, not even, it's not even segregation. Yes, Allah says yes. in the Quran, "Hold on to the rope of Allah and do not create exactly. divisions." Exactly, Habla Allah, Allah says, Habla Allah, the rope of Allah, hold on to it firmly and be not divided. So Islam is a communal religion. We eat together, we pray together, we, we you know, funerals, weddings, celebrations are together. Islam is an antidote to uh, egotism. It's an mm. antidote to narcissism. It's an antidote to uh, individualistic living and that's uh, and, and, and this is what the western trying to teach us we are individuated units we are just one unit in a capitalist system in a consumer system we're just one unit we talk about data points there we are just one data set right well you know one data point in the data set of the collective consumerist economy islam mm. says look you're collective in the way of good allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you know come together to enjoy good and to forbid but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran you are the best group of people brought forth of mankind yeah. and islam is all about you know collective you know being in unison collective, yeah. collective consciousness and i actually tweeted today saying thanks to the 
Zionists, we've actually come together in a, in a big way. Yeah. You know, a lot of people united. You know, like yesterday I was in Islam studio offices and alhamdulillah met Iqbal Sakrini, like a lot of brothers, Ibrahim Khan from Islamic Finance Guru, you know, guys who alhamdulillah who are leaders in their respective fields. Mm. Honestly, hugging me, taking pictures, giving me support. And I never thought I'd get that. And that's mm. the honor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon us as Muslims. He's made us part of Ummah. Yeah. We are not alone. And together we can go so far, uh, Majid. You know, the Muslim dollar is worth a lot. Our economy is worth a lot. We need to have an alternative mm. to, you know, a river based banking. Uh, we should have our own commerce. We should have our own economy. Just like the, you know, talk about um, colonialism, just like the yeah. black in Harlem in the 1930s, they had Black Wall Street, right? They had their own market, mm. the which was recession proof. Read yeah. history. In 1930s, Great Depression didn't hit the black markets in, in, in Harlem. Right? They had mm. their own thriving economy. So, when, you know, yeah. when people say recession and the plague, it doesn't mean everyone yeah. went through that. Because <laughs> we yeah. know Muslims have been and, you know, was flourishing during the, the dark ages or whatever. Yeah, because they're not all invested in, 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 in the mainstream uh, exactly. commercial ties, are they? And the similar goes with other communities as well. Ones we were just talking about, you know, they'll only trade between themselves to try and uplift, even if it's slightly more expensive um, yeah. or it costs a little bit more, they'll still buy from them to uplift their own brothers. And this is something I think, again, goes back to colonialism where we, the divide and rule, the divide and conquer strategy it's, has always worked. Exactly. And we forever remained divided. And the nail in the coffin was in, I think, 1922, 1924, and I think 22 wasn't at the end of the Khilafah. 24, um, it's actually about three weeks from now, 24. March, 5th of March, I think, yeah. The yeah, Ottoman, at the door come, yeah. And you know, yeah. this all this all stemmed from the First World War when mm. Archbishop Ferdinand, uh, Franz Ferdinand got shot, Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed. First World War, Second World War, the you know, uh, collapse of the Khalafa between the, the two mm. wars, right? And mm. exactly 100 years in a few weeks. And yeah, yeah it, it, collectively, Islam was powerful, divided, nation states came about. By the way, 100 years ago, Mm. There was no nation states, was there? It was like you know, there was areas like austro hungarian yes. area. Yes. The, these no man-made Pakistan, borders. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, how is it that Libya and Algeria and Egypt have got this line between them? And one minute you can have one leg in one country and another leg in another country. Makes yeah. no sense. Yeah. You know, throughout history, human history, we had regions. You know, yeah, had, land of the Hejaz. Land, yeah. Was, yeah, Hejaz. A lot yeah, of these so countries didn't even weren't even, weren't even called the names that they have today. Exactly, absolutely arbitrary, artificial, and mm. all kind of, uh, you know, um, vestiges of drunken mm. British statesmen just drawing lines randomly on a map. Yeah. Literally, that's what it is, right? You know, that's exactly lines. what it was, yeah. <laughs> Subhanallah. And again, yeah. that goes into colonialism, isn't it? Like imperialism 100%. and mm. uh, haughtiness, this hubris mm. that, that not just Britain had, by the way. I would mm. say Belgians and Dutch had it more. Just a okay. collective European superiority complex where white yeah. privileged yeah. In, yeah. these are our subjects by the way yeah. and it goes back to kipling where he wrote the poem about 200 years ago the white man's burden great mm. poem but you mm. you know you say yeah don't don't listen to you know don't hemingway and roald dahl and and mm. um all these guys and uh you know kipling they were racist but that was the flavor of the month they were all yeah. generally quite racist and fascist. Yeah. Yeah. They genuinely yeah. saw the white race as superior. If they didn't, yeah. where did the transatlantic slave trade happen? You know, because well, they literally. And it, it, and it, it doesn't even have to go. <clears throat> yeah, and it doesn't have to go that far. We look at, you know, you, you, you even read what uh, Winston Churchill wrote, you know, about yeah. the Palestinians and, exactly. you know, him being res responsible for uh, the famine in Bangladesh and, you know, yeah. the atrocities that were caused. Today, if that guy was alive, he would be in the Hague, being you know tried on. But the thing is, you've got the the staunch nationalists who would fight their corner, seeing them as heroes. They can't you, they can't fathom, comprehend any other image of this person they've held as a hero all their life. It's they're like their gods. They were the G's, you know, it's little G's. They're their gods, aren't they? You know, they're the people who they've worshipped. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, addresses in the Quran about the gods, the different gods that people... Uh, I mean, what they don't realize today is it's not always necessarily somebody who you literally pray to, but somebody who you hold to such high esteem that, yeah. you know, you're giving them that, that equivalent. It's a false equivalence. Exactly. You know? And it's a good point, by the way, because, um, you know, growing up in South Asia, 
well, not growing mm. up, but having background there, we thought, and I thought for majority of my life, by the way, that polytheism, shirk, is what the Hindus do, mm. and the Buddhists do, perhaps, by right? the worship mm. idols, right? of actual physical idols. Uh, and that's yeah, a very small point. minority, by the way. So, mm. a shirk could be worshipping your ego, your career. Yeah. Could be worshipping yes. your employer. Could yes. be worshipping so many things, right? Status. Yeah. Yeah. Well, shirk. 100%. And also, I said, why he does he mention it? Shirk as Vulumud Adheem. He said that about Luqman when he speaks to his son. All son, do not uh, associate partners with Allah. Because it's a, it's, it's a Vulumud Adheem. It's a big volume, mm. you know, big, big mm. transgression against yourself. But yeah. it, it, shirk is a very, very powerful concept which we need to understand. It's very granular and very nuanced. We can't yes. see it as, as idol worship. That's yes. one. That's a very physical. That's, yeah, that's a physical, or, tangible, obvious yeah, form of it. Exactly. But there are some, like you said, there, there are nuances. Allah says in the Quran, you know, we will be, you will be tested, and people will be committing shirk with their wealth, and from the children as well. Yeah, and exactly. you think to yourself, how, well, hang on. How is that possible? Commit, committing shit with wealth. We, we, we don't worship wealth. You don't. You know, it's not like what like the. You know, you have some. You see in Bollywood movies sometimes the murti of whatever it is, and then you praying to that. No, it's not even that. It's simple concepts like the moment, because you know, uh, the Prophet ﷺ says the difference between us and them, believers and unbelievers, is the difference of the salah, right? Yeah. Some scholars say that uh, this means that if you don't pray, you're a kafir. Some scholars say that, no, if you don't pray, you are at that point uh, committing an act of kufr, right? So there's a difference. You don't necessarily become kafir, but it's an act of kufr. It's an act of disbelief. Where the shirk element comes into that, according to some scholars, is the fact that when you are focusing on wealth generation over your obligation to pray, the obligatory prayers, what have you taken as the most superior and the most exactly. important reason? You've yeah. taken that more important. So there, you have worshipped that. Yeah, exactly. And you should be, you should be worshipping Allah. And children will be also a test for us in the same yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, your children and your wives are a fitna for you. He actually says it's fitna. Yeah, you know, it's trial. A test for you. Yeah. And uh, another thing, you know, we spoke about Adam. We did a very good podcast, actually, me and Adam a few weeks ago. Shout out to Adam Khan, uh, Khan Fitness. And uh, he yeah, said something so Adam, deep, yeah. and mashallah, brothers, because he, he studied in a um, madrasa, I think. He's got an Islamic he background did, yeah, as well. Yeah. And he combines it with fitness. It's fantastic yeah. to see him. Mm. So he says, as someone who's gluttonous and eating, or whatever the case may be, you know, pornography, whatever addiction to mm. something, mm. he's taking his desire as a god, right? And that's that, yeah. you know what? Yeah. It's actually right. He, he, yeah. What he says is right. Yeah. SubhanAllah. And Allah says yeah. in the Quran, have you not seen the one who takes his desire as his god? <laughs> Yes, and it's so true, yeah. right? And you can you can apply that to any addiction or any kind of yeah. obsession, etc. You've literally yeah. taken your desires as your god, mm. your dopamine yeah. as your god. It's very deep. Yeah. yeah, it's very deep. And this is where I think a lot of a lot of us, who, like like you said, when we were brought up uh, in in Southeast Asia or with that kind of influence, we always think that shirk and um, polytheism it, it just refers to physically praying to yes. multiple entities other exactly. than God. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's this is this is deep stuff, and and I, I think most people wouldn't wouldn't have had this kind of um, I don't know an in, investigative kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, conversation on on these kinds of topics. But it's I know brothers who have, and I know you know uh, people who have, which really got me into this kind of conversation because it's, I find it very fascinating from a psychological perspective, yes. NLP perspective. We Absolutely. as human human beings. You know the way we communicate with each other. What are we communicating from our physical appearances, from the way we speak our languages, the the words we choose to use, the word we choose not to use. You know, mm -hmm. everything has an effect. Sometimes the what we choose not to say says more about us than what we choose to say. <laughs> you know? Exactly, and it's all you know. Like if you read about linguistics and NLP, very good. Obviously, in the context of Gaza as well. You know, someone mm. like Noam Chomsky, mm. you know, very famous linguist, talks a lot about NLP and you know children's linguistic processing centers getting mature by the age of seven etc very interesting and that's why you learn your attachments right your emotional languages your your love languages so to speak your mbti yeah. which can later yeah. be assessed yeah. are you a enfj or infj etc mm. you can all be assessed yeah. later on but these are nlp right it's first seven years yeah, of your yeah. life very 100%. interesting but the mainstream media know this and they play on it so there was a study done with how the bbc was using certain types of language uh, or words when they were reporting 
from on the Palestinian side and, and they were mm-hmm. using a different type of language yes. when it, when reporting on, on the Israeli side. For example, the, the emotive words like father, mother, son, you know, these were used more commonly for the Israeli side, when the people who had died, in comparison to the Palestinian side who died much uh, in higher volumes. But yeah. the emotive words were attached to the... Exactly. <clears throat> the Gazan civilians died died and the but the Israelis, Israelis got killed. killed yeah exactly. yeah subhanallah yeah. These, and it's all deliberate imagine. by the way it, yeah. it's all you know like Allah lifted the curtain for me for, for media yeah. like you know yeah. the, the big production kind of company for you more than more than most you know because you were in the midst of it and you, you I suppose you, you your face became uh, uh, popular because of your stance and, and you sticking by your faith and your values so uh, I think for you more than most I think you uh, can become like a case study for for the average person of what yeah. happens when you speak up and what kind of backlash to expect um yeah. but this is what people fear uh, asif you know i, I mean I, I was off social media for eight months this year i do an annual detox every ramadan i come off social media i, cl- I eat clean i exercise more 10 miles cycling before iftar you know wow. my diet changes everything changes uh, for yeah. I mean, at my age, you know that you got to be a bit careful, you know, with what, <laughs> what you do. But, but, I, I, everything changes. This year, I was off for eight months. I, I didn't even feel like coming back on social media. The podcast was on hold. Um, uh, all my social media activities, my coaching group, everything was on hold. But as soon as the Palestinian issue arose, I felt that we needed to be a part of the the voices to to mm. show support. But even now, I mean, how many has been about five months now nearly? <clears throat> even now, there are people within my circles who influencers, leaders, um, people with uh, good following uh, haven't yet, even up till now, had the courage to say anything. Not even anything neutral. You know, Majid, what that is, yeah? I don't know what that background is, like ethnically. Mm. But this comes from a scarcity mindset. And yeah, this is again, mostly Asians. Oh, right, okay. Again, it's a vestige of colonialism. Yeah. You know, again, Churchill and all that. Yeah. You know, let them make whatever, get all the rice from the, you know, you know, West Bengal and Calcutta, bring it to the, mm. to the soldiers in the Second World War, let mm. them starve. You know, these guys are not important. So we've grown up in a mm. scarcity mindset. Scarcity mm. mindset. And we bring that even to a land of plenty. Even mm. to a land plenty like the UK, we bring that scarcity mindset. So if I speak up, my career might be damaged, reputation. Mm. And I know mm. people very big, like in, in the media, I've not said a single word. Mm. Colonial inferiority complex on steroids. Yeah, 100%. This needs addressing. 100%. NLP for these guys, honestly. They need, yeah. they, need, they need CBT, NLP, they need all the kind of, uh, you know, psychological uh, therapies. And talking therapies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it's, subhanAllah, it's deep. This trauma is deep, by the way. This trauma yeah. is deep. I agree. I agree. I agree. Well, like, you know what? This is fascinating stuff. And and these are the things that people that you mentioned, Adam, me and Adam would talk about as well. We've talked about some of those people within our circles and how, you know, uh, their, their silence has kind of uh, given us a different look or, or perception about them and the way we, we would interact with them or, or, or deal with, with, with them. Because look, I, you know, one of the most common things is what, what's going to change if I say something. You know, that's the one one of the most common exactly. things they say. What's going to change if I some, say something? Just by me saying something, what's going to change? I'm not that special. I'm not that important. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's funny how those kind of uh, things are used as 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 an excuse. We know, uh, you know, I know those of us who use the meta platform. People on, for example, Facebook. My um, post viewings have gone down. They barely yeah. hit double digits when I talk about Palestine. Usually, yeah. and in anything else, I'm close to 100, if not more, interactions on my post. Yeah. Um, and that's just on, on, a, on a general topic. On a more extraordinary topic, they're in the hundreds. But anything to do with uh, Palestine uh, and what's going on over there, is shadow by yeah. it. Now, if what we were saying didn't have an effect, why would they spend so much effort in trying to silence us silence exactly simple you know the prophet says when you see an injustice taking place change it with your hands if you can't change it with your hands you change it with your tongue speak up against it and if you can't even bring yourself to do that 
then you hate it in your heart and that is the lowest yes. form of iman we exactly. have become people of hate it in your heart that's, that's it. it we haven't got the yeah. balls to yeah. speak out exactly and, and also at a time where our voices can be amplified mm. social media can amplify our voices mm. but we're yeah. still deciding to remain quiet but Hang this on. is why even like when we look at topics like feminism i, I do podcasts on very taboo subjects yeah. i talk about things which people think about but they don't want to talk about it they have discussions behind closed doors but i'll put my neck on the line for it i did a podcast on feminism and the title was feminist who needs them anyway um yeah. <laughs> and and i got a lot of stick for it but one thing i realized through that experience was the stick that i got was before i even went live because i it was on the promo material that i got stick for it um the other the other one was about um second chances people who are married or divorced or married and divorced again given given another chance why shouldn't you you know it's unfair for people to be looked down upon or look be, be seen as used goods yes. because i use the term used goods i got stick for it again but one thing again i i realized and i get into trouble all the time one thing i realized especially like for that for example the feminist one i used to, i was getting private messages from sisters saying inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun that's it it's the end it's the end for you mate Do you know what i mean you're talking about feminists but when it came to the live session when we were broadcasting the the podcast it was a live stream then most of the comments that we got if not all were very anti feminist from women themselves yes what you then realize is those who bang the loudest make the loudest noise get heard doesn't mean they're the popular opinion exactly empty and barrels empty make louder make noise. noise exactly <laughs> we said the same thing yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. but you know there is a a concept in psychology mm. called the sunken cost fallacy mm. very good concept by the way and it's what keeps people addicted to gambling we talked about addictions right gambling is mm. a big addiction by the way huge yeah. i've got past and they all put gambling shops in uh poor areas people yeah. of the least they gamble more subhanallah yeah this is why islam we mentioned earlier is a full system right honestly uh, majid if people followed islam nhs would fix overnight because there'd be yeah. less diabetes there'd be less drinking and less so many things subhanallah i, I could go on so many so things many. right yes and you know death is a big problem death mental health and then self delusion gambling mm. starts in a lot of times right mm. you know interest usury all that kind of islam solves so many problems subhanallah oh yeah the khalafa for, for many centuries right not perfect but you know as perfect as humans can be right yeah you know in imperfect world anyway mm. what i'm trying to say is um i forgot what i was saying uh what was it? <laughs> Uh, we were talk you were talking about um uh empty barrels make louder noise and you went on to oh, yeah sorry i was talking about sunken cost fallacy right sunken cost yeah so how how does gambling so suppose you gamble i never gamble i'm sure you have it as well you no. put 10 pound in and you lose it and you're like you know what i don't want to go home now because i'm going to go home with minus 10 so let me put another 10 in 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 a chance i may win 20 so i've got something back and mm. that's and then you lose 100 and like you know I can't I can't go home minus 100 so let me put 200 in so I can, at least I can get you know e- either equivocal or some profit mm. this is and then you end up spending 1000 and and you you know there's no chance you're going to win it's all rigged in favor, in favor of the house anyway the same as as a feminism right as an example so women mm. are put so much, um the eggs in one basket Uh, you know I'm uh, part in the pond by the way part in the pond mm. women are put the eggs <laughs> you know they put the eggs, they clock late you know so uh you could put that in the towel right <laughs> you know what I mean? so um they've put so much emphasis and trust in a career master's degree in phd blah 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 blah, blah. and once they get to a certain age by the way, by the way I get a lot of dms from sisters in the 35 etc doctor asif are you looking are you looking are you looking mm. for marriage and mm. they subhanallah have been missold a lie but they they don't want to believe they've been missold a lie because they put so much into it yeah, yeah. they don't want to understand that they've been missold a a truth mm. a missold a, a life that yeah you can get a career yeah. and you can get a husband you can have it all right that's the feminist fallacy yeah. by the way you can have it all you can have your degree your career yeah. and then you can get any husband you want hence the dms from girls like you know past a certain mm. age Because mm. feminists have told them, yeah, you can get any guy. You can get any yeah. guy. 
yeah. you go girl yeah. you get your PhD yeah. Yeah, yeah, your job blah blah blah, blah and yeah. then you can get any guy you want no 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 you yeah. can't it's a fallacy no, it's absolutely it fallacy. fallacy and it's called a sunken cost fallacy mm. and, and a lot of people are starting to talk about this quite openly and women are uh, I think a lot of these uh, feminists uh, I'm using inverted commas here because they're so-called feminists I don't even think they believe themselves fully that they were feminists or understood the concept themselves because there are a lot of sisters who did follow that ideology and thinking but they've reverted back to yeah. understand I mean I've come across recently sisters who have um, you know it, it's, it's, it's actually quite refreshing to see you know professional sisters who are like saying look this is just a stopgap for me mm -hmm. I'm not into this career thing I want to be uh, a wife I, I have a very strict code of life from an Islamic perspective um, I understand my responsibilities I want a masculine man, right? You know, who knows his boundaries and mine. I'd like for a man to be able to say, you know what? I don't think that's appropriate to wear. And this is a sister saying it, you know what I mean? I'm thinking, wow, Why you're an anomaly in this day oh, and age. But Majid, because that speaks to their femininity. Fitra. The fitra. <clears throat> fitra is there, it's been masked by feminism. And I said the other day, you know, if you check my Instagram, there's a clip I said, look, if feminism is a reactionary movement to oppressive patriarchy which didn't allow women property inheritance mm. yeah. uh, literally they were the property of their husband right mm. in islam women are you know bestowed so many rights so we don't need feminism the fact yeah. that muslim women have adopted feminism when you've got yeah. a superior ideology yeah. is it is the yeah. epitome of ingratitude and allah subhanahu mm. wa ta'ala says you know if you're grateful i will give you more but if you are if you're ungrateful you know, um, my, my, my punishment is severe. This is from the Quran. Mm. You know, yeah. I will increase you if you're grateful. And what is ingratitude, by the way, is kufr. Actually, the word Allah SWT uses interchangeably kufr and ingratitude. You know, okay. and sugar is half of your mm. faith. So yeah. Allah's giving the, Isla the Islamic paradigm, Islamic system, the Nizam mm. al-Islam. Yet you are still adopting isms and ologies, which are mm. second and third rate at best. Yes. And the fact that you're adopting them, what is it? It goes back to the first thing we said. Shirk. Mm. You're, accepting, you know, you're accepting a system other than what Allah SWT has ordained. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a whole system. You can't just pick and choose what you want out of a system. And yeah. label yourself, you're a follower of a system when you, you're not following the system. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's, it's an I, oxymoron, I, isn't it? Exactly. And you know, uh, Majid, you know, this might be controversial, but this is exactly my opinion. And, you know, I have yeah. no fear. Only to Allah SWT. A lot of controversy here. Uh, but it's, contra it's controversial because why? Because I, I, I qualify this as to why it's controversial because Rasul Sallallahu told us Islam started mm. as something strange yes. and it will return and it to return. Yes. So give glad, glad tidings, give glad to, the tidings to the strangers. The, yeah. the strangers. Yeah. You're strangers. Yes. Okay? I can't say yes. myself with a stranger. Okay? I'm, yeah. and I'm a stranger as well, by the way. I'm a Pashtun living in the UK, doesn't belong yeah. in Pakistan, doesn't belong in Afghanistan. I'm a traveler. Uh, you know, Ashikira says, I have no home. So I'm a traveler. You're, you're in every sense of the nomadic. Word, right? It's a nomadic no, lifestyle. Nomadic, you're, I'm a nomadic. You're, and we also you're nomadic. An, Sorry? You're an ongoing muhajir, aren't you? you know exactly. I mean? <laughs> and, and we are supposed to be muhajir. Because Rasul yes. said, well, the believer is, the, is a traveling, you know? Dunya, al-Sijjan al-Mu'min, or Jannah al kafir We're a traveler, right? So I'm a traveler in every sense of the word. So I have no fear 100%. why. 100%. And I think we should embrace that. Because we were just talking about identity just now. And we were talking about, uh, you were talking about the Pashtun background. You're neither there, you're neither here. I, I did a podcast on this, I think it was called um, Who Do You Think You Are? Or, or, you know, Who Do You Think You Are Anyway? Or something like that. Um, or go back to where you came from, I think it was. Or where do I go? Because here, I mean, I'm British born. I'm born here. Um, second generation, my parents came in the 60s. Um, and then here, I'm, just by the colour of my skin, I'm not yeah. always accepted as a British person by the average white guy out there, yeah? If I go back to where I came from, or where my ancestors came from, where my parents, uh, my my grandparents originated from India, Agra, from from their ancestry tree. You've got the uh, Turkic Mongolian kind ah. of influence over there, right? And so the Mongols. Beard you've got, mashallah. Do you like it? Do you like it? Yeah, yeah. I love it. I try looking great. for it. It's, it's, it's a bit rough at the moment. I need to groom it a little bit, but they, it's a proper Urdu girl Osman beard, isn't it? I used, yeah yeah I used to have a um, I used to have a handlebar moustache as well and you'll see it on some of my social media handles, uh, yeah. but I've I've trimmed it down now. Ramadan's coming as well. I'm trying to be a good boy, uh, yeah. but uh, 
but yeah you know you have the ancestry line you're settled in pakistan your your uh-huh. grandparents were or your parents were throughout most of their youth then they came here then they settled here where's where do you belong you go to pakistan and people say hey, there comes a british here exactly they, they that can smell the, you off they can smell the way you far. walk the way you dress as the well you walk the way you yeah. talk yeah exactly the, the thing i was getting getting at about strangers and you know like being a muhajir because we, we should internalize that by the way we should internalize the fact that this mm. is not our resting place it's a testing place mm. not resting place. yes 100%. but the reason why that's, I say that's a very good way of putting it you know, testing, it's a testing place not resting place exactly yeah. maybe just yeah like you know uh, to be tested and allah swt says you know we will surely test you with loss of life and loss of fruits and loss of your labor and you know loss of you know so many things mm. uh bashir sabirin will give glad tidings mm. to the patient one but the reason why i'm saying magic is this is something i tweeted about actually maybe i, th- I can't remember if i tweet, tweeted about it maybe it's too hard to be tweeted about but i'll tell you anyway i said look mm. there's four years right and i do a lot of coaching for divorced fathers okay. who have been who have been bitten by subhanallah feminist muslims and i said this actually mm. it's all wrong story yeah so we talk about mm. femininity you, you know you, you talked about you talked about before in your podcast femininity which is mm. the antithesis of masculine fe- fe- feminist women you know? masculine masculine feminist women or the antithesis the 180 degree polar opposite of feminine women which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the quran you know they are soft and nurturing and etc kind of thing allah says you know content women right first so the, the four rooms of the ladder right as, as mm. practicing muslim brothers in the uk this is why mm. i coach I, i coach mainly muslim I, i've got a few punjabi sikh clients but usually muslim men right mm. four you want a wife who is a a feminine muslim mm. right mm. if you can't get that you settle for a feminine ahli kitab woman mm. as in she is from ahli kitab allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. has made this right in the quran yeah. the prophet sallam had safiya who was a Jewish ancestry yeah, had, uh, yeah. Maria Kibtia who was of a uh, Coptic Christian ancestry mm. hence the name Kibtia you know Copt so Ahl Kitab and mm. I know brothers I, I, I know practicing brothers honestly practicing Alhamdulillah mm. five times Salah they've got Christian wives uh, you know Orthodox L- Lutheran Christians even so mm. fem- feminine Muslim <clears throat> feminine Muslim is obviously that's the goal right yeah yeah, feminine yeah. Ahl Kitab the mm. third step is a feminine Ahl Kitab, and this and this is what the controversy lies, by the way, because I put mm. feminist Muslim at the bottom. That's the bottom of the rung. Right. Okay. But mentioned earlier, my just yeah. pick and choose, picking literally yeah. picking and choosing. <coughs> so the picking and choosing hadith to get their rights, mm. and the picking feminism to shun their responsibilities. Subhanallah. Mm. Yeah, get it? that's very true. You that's right? very it's true. Double, it's, 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 it's a double. It's, yeah. it's a double. Well, right so they they you you know taking rights from islam which they should by the way of course islam is yes. on them yes. but they're taking yeah. rights which they should yeah. but they're not dispensing their responsibilities yeah so subhanallah yes. the, the fourth steps the bottom wrong and a lot of the brothers mm. i'm uh, you know divorce coaching um, my clients they've been bitten by bottom of the wrong women subhanallah yeah. i've actually and seen you know, that yeah i've seen that, you know, that happen Yeah. And I got in trouble for this, by the way. I talked about Morocco and like you know get a feminine Muslim because that, that's the that's the epitome, right? You want a Muslim, yeah. of course. You know, yeah. you have a choice between a, a Muslim and a practicing Christian or Jewish woman. You obviously go for the Muslim, okay? Yeah. It's not sinful, by the way, to marry a Christian. It's not sinful. You can do it. No, it's not. But no, it's not. Provided yeah. children, it's jais. Allah's made it jais. Mm. Mm. Uh, provided, obviously, you know, the children are Muslims, etc. Of course, yeah. Um, yeah. But it's not. It's not haram. It's, it's not makru even. You know, it's, uh, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do it, but yeah. the obviously epitome, the apex, is yeah. practicing Muslim uh, sister, right? You yeah. can grow together, of course. But mm. that's the top. But also the bottom is is her opposite, a feminist Muslim. And we're seeing the pandemic now. My I can goodness. I can see where you're coming from. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from, especially if if a sister is bending the rules of the Deen to get what she wants. Absolutely. Um, then. How much on the dean is she actually on, and you know how how good would that be for the offspring, and what kind of messages, what kind of family are you bringing up? How is that going to affect the kids? What are the boys going to turn out like? You know exactly. what are the girls going to turn out like? What kind of um, little Muslims are you spreading <laughs> or multiplying? Do you know what I mean? Uh, and, and you know, Majid, these are Alima sisters, by the way. And I, honestly, wow. I'm not my witness. I know many examples. Alima sisters, Nikabi. <clears throat> wow. Alima sisters. Wow. Child contact uh, denial, etc. 
so many things subhanallah you know like financial abuse whatever but they're niqabi yeah. so these are the muslim feminists and mm. subhanallah in my opinion Dangerous. as a doctor as a mindset coach these yeah. women have caused so much trauma to a lot of the brothers out there yeah. and we talked about you know yeah. beginning of the episode you know men who have just completely been shocked and how did they get back on their feet mm. very interesting i mean a lot of people actually uh, one of the reasons of what i've seen people um settling for not what their preferred partner would be as, as in a practicing muslim non-feminist type to the feminist type is is that there's, there's this notion of having a being in a working couple environment and growing stronger financially and you know the the priorities are elsewhere they're not necessarily on the dini aspects of life allah says you know yarzuqu man yasha bi ghayri hisab it is me who gives without account you know and, and where does he say that by the way which surah uh is it an-nisa no i believe it's, it's surah talaq i believe it might be in the sa but it's in the Actually, context of the book it's surah talaq okay. i forget I don't i don't want to misquote something but yeah, could no, be i'm pretty sure it's yeah. surah talaq and it's in the context of of, of talaq allah says by the way uh, right. because okay. the, yeah. the verse before that about you know uh part with them with a good parting and you know mm. give them a gift and allah will yeah. provide and allah said he will open up doors without you know which yeah. you didn't even think and this yeah. is conduct with divorce um but yeah. uh, you know and so sahaba by the way 50% you know half of them were divorced right rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam all of his wives were either widowed or divorced except for aisha radhiyallahu yes. anha except so, aisha radhiyallahu anha yeah you know it happens there's a surah talaq in the quran it happens it's mentioned many yeah, times in not, the quran it's not that you go out willy-nilly and take it exactly. so lightly because it's one of the the, the hate is one of the least permissible things to do as well you know yeah, what exactly, i mean it's, exactly. it's the most disliked halal yeah. thing you know exactly. the talaq is but exactly. But ultimately, it's it's a way out. So Should yeah. it be? It's a tool that's that's to be used if if needed. But it yeah. shouldn't be so uh, freely used that it becomes the norm, like it's, it's a dating thing. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. So, yeah, it's a very important. That's a very important point, isn't it? Hundred percent. Because and a lot that... of people don't have. A lot of people don't have that that um, um, uh, patience with each other. We live in a world where you look at the kids. I'm just. Yeah, you know we could talk for ages i'll just look at the, the, the at the time as well we've been going for way past an hour we live in a world where you've got people like me who were born you know we were classed as before the millennials right then you got the millennials who you know who 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 lived through the internet boom we were pre internet we 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 were the last generation to remember what the life was like without having internet we can live without the internet you got the dinosaur right Yeah absolutely you can say that you know we're growing the the spikes and all sorts we can still walk to the library and 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 uh, and hire a book you know uh to do to do our research we know how to do that we we still got a library card but then nowadays you've got the gen z's we were talking about this with somebody else who are not used to having one to one conversations they'll they would prefer to sit I'm not I don't want to generalize they're not all like that I know loads of great gen z's and great communicators but the tools that have been made available for them from a, a technological perspective they would rather if they went to visit anybody they would rather sit there on the phones texting them somebody who they're sat next to yeah, than exactly. actually having a one on one conversation one of my uh, colleagues is an associate of mine does some work for me yesterday was telling me he was at a restaurant he saw a young couple walk in beautiful looking young couple you know both with model looks uh sat there throughout the course of the whole dinner in the restaurant i think mm-hmm. for the for the whole one and a half hours most of the time they're on the phones doing selfies with each other but they only spoke with each of them possibly for about 15 minutes in total right but he says one thing i found really bizarre was within that 15 minutes they were so like really into each other really engrossed in each other's conversation but one thing also that was obvious was their attention span was so short mm-hmm. But when you when you when you're in a relationship with someone you're marrying somebody what what's that going to look like in the future exactly Do you know what i mean are you just going to just still sit there on your phones and text each other from across the couch yeah, exactly it's a mad Short you know attention spans a digital world has had, has had its benefits but it's certainly dysregulated our dopamine you know people yeah, can't really focus on and you know what a shame that is people going in life without ever reading a hard yeah. back or a paperback Yeah, 
I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not much of a reader myself, right? I'm more of an audiovisual learner um, and kinesthetic. Um, reading, I could, I would avoid if I, if you know, if I could. There are certain things that I get engrossed in, like uh, when it's religious stuff. I really get engrossed in the, you know, the different uh, tafasirs of the Quran or you know the fatawa of the different shuyukha in different for different kind of search situations. I'm fascinated by them. But you can't really do anything but read them because those you can't around. Maybe if somebody translating something else is different. But one of the issues when you're talking about relationships is because that um, uh, patience isn't there amongst yeah. the Gen Z uh, or even the next generation from from mine from my side, then that patience to endure each other's downsides or negatives that threshold has has, has become yes. become pretty low. Absolutely. As if you know what we could probably go on for ages, um, you know, and, and it's never ending. So we've been on online for uh, an hour, fifteen minutes. It's been an honor and real play privilege uh, to have you here, and uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. You know, it's it's Me been too. right down my street. You know, let's do part two in person because I think we could have yeah. a lot of future conversations. I think so. I think so. I will, we'll have to organize that, inshallah. Maybe we'll do iftar together one day, or maybe we can organize with some other brothers to come together and do a uh, do, 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 do get a collective group together. Now, but, sorry, uh, for now, great. yeah, for now, I mean, I want to thank you for, for coming on. It's been uh, very enlightening, very educational. Any final words for, for the viewers before we click this off? No, uh, final words is thank you, Majid. Thank you so much. Uh, follow Majid across platforms. And uh, no, thank, thank you for having me. Hopefully, I'm giving you some value, and uh, yeah, let's let's do part two in person over some some tea and uh, some jai shai. Some jai shai, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Zakalaka. Thank you very much, guys. We're going to end this here. Uh, thank you for joining us. Make sure you do like and subscribe. I never say this. I've never really focused on on doing this. Just we've, we've been having uh, very good conversations. But do do uh, subscribe to the channels. Myself and uh, Dr. Asif uh, Manaf, and we'll see you in the next one, inshallah. Thank you very much.